Sweden, birthplace of pop stars ABBA, Ace of Base, and Greta Thunberg. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. And the go-to vacation spot for American celebrities like ASAP Rocky and Lou Perez. But I'm kind of a star. Okay, if anyone asks in Sweden about me, just tell them I'm really big in the States. Speech, too short to protest. All I know about Sweden are Ikea, Ikea's meatballs, and of course, Sweden's super successful brand of democratic socialism, which may or may not be sold in Ikea. If you've been listening to US politicians like Bernie Sanders, Sweden seems to be doing everything right. Both of you identify as democratic socialists. And my policies most closely re resemble what we see in the UK, in Norway, in Finland, in Sweden. And I think we should look to countries like Denmark, like Sweden, and Norway, and learn from what they have accomplished for their working people. Okay, what lessons can Americans learn from Sweden's democratic socialism? I flew all the way from New York to Stockholm to learn all I can about this mythical Scandinavian land. Is Sweden socialist? No. Is Sweden democratically socialist? No, it's democratic, but not socialist. What am I even doing here? You should make a doc about democratic socialism, they said. Sweden's democratically socialist, they said. You should go to Sweden, they said. Well, they were wrong. Now what? I've already been to the ABBA Museum. Twice. All right, my flight doesn't leave for five days and I've already hired the crew, so I might as well stick around and learn something. I guess. So what is Sweden? How would you describe Sweden's economic model? I'd say it's a free market uh, capitalist economy based on open trade and with a fair amount of government redistribution of the proceeds. Do you have any insight as to why American politicians continue to use countries like Sweden as the model? Yeah, it's very interesting because Sweden really had a 20-year period when we experimented with socialism and to see if, whether it worked or not. And it didn't. It ended in spectacular failure. But for some reason, this is the 20-year period that all of you remember. And what happened was that in 1970, Sweden was one of the richest countries on the planet because we've had this 100-year period of um, very competitive businesses, always exposed to foreign competition, always very low taxes, lower than in the United States uh, for a very long time. And we thought, wow, we're top of the world. We can do anything. And if you think you can do anything, you also sort of forget what brought you there. So our politicians began to think that now let's just redistribute everything. Let's regulate business and even experiment with sort of government ownership of businesses. We doubled the size of the government, of government consumption uh, of GDP, increased taxes and regulated everything. This is what the rest of the world remembers. You think that, look, Sweden is one of the richest places on the planet, and yet they're more socialist than we are. But it was like that old joke, you know, how do you end up with a small fortune? Well, you start with a large fortune, and then you waste lots of it. And that's what we did for 20 years. I'm just amazed that you were able to get out of that without bloodshed because it, that seems almost like a has all the callings of a revolution coming. That was the time when we pulled ourselves back from the brink. One prominent politician said that, look, we have to realize that the, the, the experiment with democratic socialism failed. The policies were perverse, unsustainable, and absurd. And that politician was the social democratic minister of finance. And at that time, in a broad consensus from the left to the right, they opened up the Swedish economy again. They shrank the size of government, they reduced taxes, they deregulated the product markets and opened up Sweden for business again. And now we're back on track, but, but it almost killed us. I don't know if you're familiar with death metal, like black death metal. I am. Which is pretty, uh, uh, do you listen to it? Or? No, but there's a death metal singer which is also called Andreas Bay. So we are sharing the name. Do you ever get stopped on the street and people say? No, we look very different. <laughs> it's very that. easy to tell back the economist from the death metal singer. When you think of a welfare state, 
you think of a system that taxes the rich and gives to the poor. That's not the case in Sweden. Uh, you pay taxes when you're working, but you get money when you're not working. And most of your taxes are actually just redistributed over your life cycle. They are not handed to the lazy or the poor. They are given back to yourself later in life. How high were taxes? So around 1980, the marginal income tax uh, at its highest was around 90%. 90%? Yes. But we were also uh, quicker in reforming our tax system and pulling them back when we noticed that things are not working. The biggest problem with marginal taxes around 90% is of course the amount of tax planning that anyone will do in order to avoid paying those high taxes. So very few firms actually paid them but rather moved their incomes or uh, shipped them to other countries or rewarded their uh, employees in other ways uh, which meant that the high tax rate only created tax planning rather than tax revenue. So basically whatever they could do to avoid paying taxes. Yes. To, you know, yeah. I remember reading about how ABBA used to wear these very wild outfits as a way to get a tax deduction because according to the law, if your outfit was something that no reasonable person would wear in public, it could be uh, tax deductible. Yes, that is one of many examples of oddities created by the Swedish tax system. The dirty little secret of the Swedish model is that we don't squeeze the rich, we squeeze the poor. We take most of the money from uh, the poor and the middle classes because they are loyal taxpayers. They don't move to Monaco, they don't have tax lawyers or anything like that. The bulk of income tax payments is from a um, payroll tax at around 30% and then a local regional uh, income tax at 30% and they are both flat taxes, uh, not progressive. And then we get almost as much as we get in income taxes, we take in excise taxes and consumption taxes. We have a VAT at 25%. So the poor pay exactly the same when they go to the store and buy whatever they need as the rich do. Uh, that's what Swedish Social Democrats realized fairly early on. We can have a big government or we can make the rich pay for it all, but we can't do both of these things. How can you be a progressive country if you don't have progressive taxation? Hey Sweden, why are you taxing everyone when you can just have the billionaires pay for everything? Sweden is a unicorn factory. Unfortunately, they don't make those kinds of unicorns. No, a unicorn is a privately held startup that's valued at over a billion dollars. Sweden is second only to Silicon Valley when it comes to the number of unicorns per capita. So yeah, Sweden is a lot more than just IKEA. In fact, this year, the World Economic Forum ranks Sweden in the top 10 of its global competitiveness index, and first globally in macroeconomic stability. I'll be impressed when I find out what that means. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, can you tell me what that means? <laughs> It means that we're a pretty stable place. We have, at least for the last decade, seen big business and also new startups, innovative businesses. They are the ones who are creating the wealth, the jobs, the innovations that will make Swedes productive in the, in the future as well. We have trade unions that are remarkably interested in the well-being of businesses because they've realized that restructuring, even if it's painful in the short run, lots of people lose their jobs, that's the only way to create more wealth in the future and I think it's partly the results in the 1970s and 1980s. We uh, weren't a very welcoming place for innovators, entrepreneurs and businesses. The businesses left, all the ones that you've heard of, the Ikeas of Sweden, the Tetra Packs, they left for other places, for Switzerland, for the Netherlands and, and other places. Our entrepreneurs, our innovators left, even our, our sportsmen left. And that resulted in a horrible situation. We didn't create a single net job in the private sector for 30 years. That makes you sort of focus your mind and pay attention to uh, the needs of, of the business sector. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, a very <laughs> fine dressed cat just <laughs> walked through the. <laughs> yeah. A cat in a turtleneck. <laughs> yeah. 
Anders, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you. Uh, pleasure. I, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Anders. 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 Look at that. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Public health care had problems. Uh, it didn't function as good as it should have. So we had long queues. We had waiting time to get access to health care. Patients didn't get their operations on time and you couldn't reach your doctor. So there was a, a public pressure, something needed to be done, and therefore the politicians opened up the entire sector. But now you can choose, as an individual, you can choose to go to one provider, which is private, or you can go to the to public provider. It's your own choice. 20, 25 years ago, you were not allowed to choose. There were You, you, did, you couldn't have chosen anything because you only had uh, the public part. And those who have a private health care insurance, they are uh, well, the majority of them are low or middle income uh, and they often work in small businesses because f for a small business owner, it's a way of, uh, of uh, improving your working uh, conditions for your employees uh, to have this kind of insurance. If government-run healthcare works so well, then why would you need to introduce a private option? It doesn't make any sense. You've seen the tweets. College is free in many countries around the world. Same goes for Sweden, where students don't pay a krona to attend. How do the Swedes manage to provide free education for their college students? There is no such thing as a free education, not in any country. Uh, we just have chosen another model to fund the education system. So we do it through public funding and through taxes. In the United States, we have an incredible amount of, of student debt. Is that a similar thing in, in Sweden? Or? Actually, yeah. I think we are worse. So that's a strange thing about Sweden. We have like a very generous system for student aid, but we still have like the, the highest debts in the world among students. Wow. Yeah, but I've never heard about that in, yeah. in Sweden. I always heard, you know, free. Yeah a huge amount of debt when we graduate. And one of the other consequences is that we don't have the, the return on investment in Sweden is quite low compared to other countries. And I think it's because we have the model of the welfare system. So in some occupations, you will never get the return on the investment you do in higher education. It will be negative. So I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Even though college is publicly funded, people still need to get grants or take out loans in order to be able to go to college. Yes, they do. So they don't pay any fees, but they borrow money to live for during the time they actually study. On average, a Swedish student spends six years for a four-year education program in Sweden. I think the big difference is that uh, the United States have a number of really good elite colleges and some that are probably not so good. Whereas in Sweden, most colleges and universities are tax financed and of similar quality. So we sort of avoid the worst, but we also do not have the best. So you're happy mediocre. I, I think that is, that is a fair description actually. Stockholm sees only six hours of daylight in the winter time which means Sweden needs a lot of power to keep all those unicorns alive. Yet, Sweden is also intensely devoted to going green. I would say that, that Sweden has, um, we have one of the best uh, electricity systems in, in the world today. We have very low climate footprints, we have a lot of nuclear, a lot of hydropower, and we have wind coming into the system. 40% of the electricity generation in Sweden is nuclear. That is absolutely a, an important part of the Swedish electricity system. Is it possible to get off of of fossil fuels without nuclear playing a role in it. Looking, for for example, at the IPCC reports, uh, they they also include nuclear in their um, in their scenarios for the future electricity system. If we're going to a, a net zero economy worldwide, so I think that nuclear uh, will be an important part. Back home, there's an ongoing debate about the Green New Deal, which calls for us to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions in 10 years. That means decarbonizing electricity and the entire US economy in a decade. And they want to do it without nuclear power. 
I don't know, it seems like a stretch for a big country like the US with a population of 330 million. But maybe Sweden, population 10 million, maybe they could do it in 10 years. It would be very, very difficult for Sweden to become carbon free uh, in that short time span. The targets that have been set now for 2045 is that is more realistic because then you have a number of years in order to, to change technology and develop and to, to get the, the uh, systems working. But of course, we also have those voices in Sweden, people wanting to go much, much further and faster. Uh, but still, um, you need to have a sort of a re realistic time span on, on how to actually make this. I would imagine that a lot of the people wanting it to go faster aren't necessarily working in the lab, developing the technology. To no. Mm -hmm. So I think even though you could wish that it would move f faster, uh, it will unfortunately take some time, even for a country like Sweden, to, to become climate neutral. Do you have a message to American politicians who continue to call Sweden the beacon of democratic socialism? If American socialists uh, want to imitate Sweden, I would say be careful what you wish for. Because if the United States would be more like Sweden, it would have to uh, deregulate markets, abolish occupational licensing, introduce more free trade. It would have to reform social security, partially privatize the pension system, introduce a national school voucher system with uh, private schools and uh, getting the same funding as public schools do. And you would also have to um, abolish taxes on property, on gifts and inheritance. It's not your grandfather's socialism. I have lots of advice for the United States. Don't try to copy Sweden and implement that in your country because Sweden arrived at where we are uh, through a very bumpy road. We learned from our mistakes, we corrected them and then we made new mistakes. Uh, and each country has to seek its path to prosperity. You have to be careful because uh, every now and then a comedian will actually fly to that country and check it out for himself. I welcome him doing so.